So to navigate, one of the first things you're going to have to know the means in order to reach your end. But this means that you're going to have to put into practice certain things, which is basically the practice of the Catholic faith, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's how you're going to reach your end, your salvation, through this period. We're in a very tumultuous time. And so you have to be able to practice your Catholic faith. But there's a few other things we need to talk about that also affect that process of saving your soul in this time. Because I think it's pretty easy when you start looking at how bad things are to either get depressed or have a certain level of despair. I often tell people, you know, when you look at how bad things are and what's happening, because all of this stuff, has, Our Lady has foretold this, it should give us a deep sense of hope because we know what she, we, we see that what she has said is true, but that means the other aspects of her revelations are also true which we'll talk right about right at the end, which gives us a certain sense of hope right, and confidence. But in all of this, one of the first things you're going to have to do on a spiritual level is you have to master detachment. Detachment is a holy indifference to all things created so that you are attached to God alone. So concretely, this means you have to stop following your emotions. You have to follow... Your intellect illumined by faith, and that's what you have to choose, and that's what you have to be do based on, not how you feel. And this is a particular difficult thing, and especially in our culture, when emotions have been raised to such a level of importance. Um, as one friend of mine says, since when was emotion ever important? And there's a certain sense in which that's true. Emotions are are have uh, they help us to execute our actions well, but people have gotten to the point where the emotions are so important and they've got to stop that because why? We're going to go through a period that's going to be, well, well, we're already in a period that's very emotionally difficult to deal with when you see the chronic lying and the constant attacks against anybody or anything that's good. The minute one guy just puts his head up, there's 50,000 people there ready with an ax to lop it off, right? And we have to be prepared to be able to um, emotionally um, not be bothered by it, frankly. With detachment, a person um, a person just doesn't react much. St. Thomas says that all emotions arise out of the emotion of love, and St. John of the Cross calls this love attachment, that you're attached to something. If you find yourself getting emotionally upset, it means there's a disordered attachment somewhere. This is true even of the church, by the way, which we'll talk about here in a minute. That also means you have to stop trusting your own judgment in matters and trust the judgment of the tradition, what the church has always said. And we've talked about this already. You have to make sure, stop making yourself the principle of judgment of the matters. What do we have to be detached from? First and foremost, you have to be detached from anything worldly, your cars, things you own, your house, your property, all that. You have to have detachment from it because we might be entering an age where that's all going to be lost. Or you might be uprooted. In order to survive, you might have to go somewhere else. And if you're going to have perfect equanimity <coughs> materially and perfect peace, you're going to have to be able to walk away from that stuff without, ha without it bothering you in the slightest. You have to have detachment from your family. Uh, most of us are experiencing the fact that there's at least one person in every family that's gone off the rails. Well, get ready. As it starts getting really nasty and ugly, a vast majority of people are going to go off the rails. So you're going to have to be prepared for that, and that means you have to have detachment even from your children, even from your husband, all of that. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, if I'm detached, does that mean I just really don't care about them? No, that's not true at all. It means that you have to be detached, you have to let loose of them and not seek them for their own sakes or for yourself, but for God's sake. In other words, you have to have due solicitude or care for them and concern and love for them for God's sake, from charity, rather than for your sake or for theirs. And this is a key thing that has to be developed so that if something happens to them, it's not going to kill you in the process. So you have to have detachment from everybody within your family. You have to have det detachment from the, from the well-being of your country. This is where we're at now. <clears throat> part of the reason people are getting so upset is because of the fact that the country which we love, which is a legitimate part of the virtue of piety, specifically patriotism, which is under piety, 
What happens though is if you don't have a sufficient detachment from your country, uh, this is the type of thing that causes things to degenerate into uh, civil war. The way things have been constructed by certain people who are in charge who made sure all this disorder got put in place before so that when they stepped out of office that all this stuff would become a problem. That was, it was all orchestrated and so now we're at a certain point where if things get much worse in our country we could easily end up in some kind of civil war because of the fact that the people who are doing evil are not going to give up the things that they're attached to which is they're disordered in their sin, etc. And they're not going to give up all what they consider advance or, or all the progress, which by the way, when people say, well, I'm a progress progressivist, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in for progress. By the way, that's just another buzz phrase the communists admitted. That was just a buzz phrase. For, they, they rebranded communism and called it progressivism. Okay. So then you... Um, so you have to have detachment from the well-being of your country. It doesn't mean that you don't fight for it. It just means that it has to be done according to your state in life, and it has to be done in a manner that doesn't affect you spiritually. Ultimately, the person who reaches a certain stage of perfection and has become detached from all created things, it doesn't matter what happens at all around them. They'll just simply look at it and see what they need to do in order for God to be served in it. Because the only thing that they're ultimately attached to is God. He's the only thing that is going to be stable through anything whatsoever in the near future. You also have to have a detachment from the state of the church. It's a mess. And it's a big mess. It seems to be getting messier. Okay. So the point being in all that is that you have to have a detachment from it so that it doesn't upset you or bother you. Even when people attack the faith, there should be a kind of willingness to suffer that. You have to be willing to just sit there and deal with the pain. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there, there should be a detachment from the state of the church. doesn't mean you don't defend the doctrines when your state calls for it and you actually know what you're talking about. doesn't mean that you don't um, pray for the church and pray for the bishops and priests, etc. But it just simply means that you have to not allow it to get to your spiritual life. You have to be detached from the news. You have to break the vice of curiosity. The bad thing about the internet, which by the way, I don't think the internet is evil. I'm not a Luddite. I do not buy John Senior's theory that technology is bad. <laughs> Or that the TV is intrinsically evil, as one other priest said. I don't buy that. These are good things. The problem is, the, better, the more powerful the tool and the better it is, the more capable it is for being used for evil. So I'm sure you've heard the statistic that at any one given time in this country, over 50% of what's going through the Internet is pornography. At one point, I won't tell you who was in office. You can look it up for yourself. At one point when there was one individual in the White House, over 80% of what was going into the White House through the Internet was pornography. So that ought to tell you something about the state of things. Okay. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, there is a curiosity, intellectual curiosity, to constantly reading all about the church and all about the state of things, etc. You have to be knowledgeable about those things, but you can't be wasting all sorts of time because it's going to drag you down spiritually. Your focus has to be on God. You have to, and you, have to, you should be reading books that are actually educate you rather than being attached to the most recent scuttle coming out of Washington. Which, by the way, at this point, it's, such, it's so silly. I just don't even really pay any attention to it anymore. All I'm doing is praying. It's the first time I've ever prayed for the President of the United States every day. If for no other reason, just to survive. Right? So... Um, you know, and the probably the funny thing is I probably wouldn't support the guy so much if all these other evil people weren't attacking him. So, but anyway, um, the uh, point is you have to have a detachment from all that and you have to be willing to allow God to determine the course of history. He is the Lord of history. Every facet of history is determined by God, either by his positive will or by his permissive will. And so we have to be willing to allow these things to happen. Not that we don't fight for what's good, but we just have to be detached from it. So we have to be detached from uh, 
all these matters in relation anything other than God, there has to be detachment. Why? Because if you go through the chastisement, you have any attachments, you will be brutalized in the process. It's that simple. Any attachment you have to anything created, once we start going through the chastisement, will be a cause of pain. That's it. That's all there is to it. You have to, that means you have to have a perfect willingness to suffer. Now, what does this mean? St. Thomas and Aristotle and the whole moral tradition say that, uh, which is actually true, that when we don't have a virtue, we have a vice, but we perform an act of virtue. It's contrary to our disposition, and therefore it causes pain. This is why when I hear people say, well, I don't like to pray, Father, because it's just it's really difficult and I have a hard time praying. I'm like, yeah, it just tells me you don't have any virtue in that area. Because a virtue is a habit, a, a good habit doing it all the time, and that just means people aren't in the habit of praying. So it's the same thing with the virtue of mortification, the virtue of mortification is one when you start engaging things that are painful, it's painful. Or when you start embracing your cross, it's simply painful. Even, not just as to the particular pain, for example, if one of your children is doing something that is bothering you and it's painful to deal with that, but there is also the concomitant pain of not wanting to go through because it's contrary to your will or it's emotionally painful. But the same, St. Thomas says, he, and along with Aristotle and the whole tradition, that virtue is its own reward, which means that as you, before, as you start to gain a certain level of virtue, there is a delight that occurs in the performance of that virtue. So as a person starts to master and gain the virtue of mortification, he actually starts to take delight in the suffering. Now here we're not talking about delight in the disorder and the pain, but delight in the fact that his soul is being purified and that he's becoming rightly ordered. It's part of the hallmark of the illuminative way, the second stage of the interior life. It's when you start seeing that. So people say, what do you think I am, Father? Well, do you find, how do you, how do, you do you mind suffering? Oh, I don't like suffering. Well, then you're not there yet, you're still in the primitive way. But this also, but in order to develop a virtue, one of the key things, so in other words, to get to the point where you suffer well, you know, when you see these people who are very saintly and they're in a lot of pain or they're suffering or they're getting beat around a lot, but they, ne they never lose their equanimity and they actually have this peace and joy about them. That's why, because they've mastered the virtue. St. Thomas says that virtues are voluntary. What does that mean? It means People, I cannot tell you how many people come to me, I'll say to them, how much are you willing to suffer? The response I always get, because when people are possessed, one of the things I'm looking for is a willingness to be completely brutalized through a process. Because if you're not, you're just not going to get out of this thing because he's going to take you down. And he's going to play on this unwillingness to suffer, this horror of suffering that we have as a result of original sin. And the response I always get is, Father, I'm suffering a lot. That's not what I asked you. I asked you, how much are you willing to suffer? One time this one woman said to me, enough to get this problem done. That wasn't what I was looking for. <laughs> but was, I thought, that's pretty clever, actually. It's pretty smart. Uh, in a kind of a carnal prudence sort of way. Okay. But the point being is, is that if you don't willingly embrace the cross, if you don't willingly submit to the suffering that God sends you in your life, you, can, you will not develop the virtue. This is why people suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer, and yet in the end they don't have any, any joy in it. Because they haven't developed the virtue because it's been contrary to will. It's been, un, it's been involuntary. They don't want it. Whereas if they're willing to suffer and embrace it for, for their purification or for God's will to be served, then what happens is that's when the joy will start to be developed. Until then, it won't be developed. If we're entering into a period of chastisement, nobody's going to have any joy or peace if they don't have that willingness to suffer. And it has to be mastered.
You have to be able to suffer well. Most people don't suffer well. One of the ways that you know that is, I kind of noticed this. It seems, I could be wrong though. It seems when I was first ordained, less people had less of a difficulty with anger. But as time goes on, people are more and more and more because they're suffering less and less, and they, which means they're not developing that virtue much, that when they do suffer just a little bit, their anger is all over the map. And that anger is an indication of unwillingness to suffer. A lot of people are really angry about the situation in the church. It's because they don't have detachment and they're, unwillingness to su they're unwilling to suffer it. The rise of the contraception mindset, I mean, the fact, that, the fact that the pill came into an existence in, was it 1958, I think, is when it came into existence, 57, somewhere around in there. And it became very quickly widespread use, even among Catholics. And then we wonder why we get bad priests, right? Well, we get the leaders we deserve. But in anger, and so but people are very angry now because of the state of the church. They're angry at the priests, they're angry at this, etc. I tell people, lay people, well, look, if you want to get this change, you've got to put on sackcloth and ashes. You've got to start suffering. If you want, you've got to start offering up your suffering for the priests and the clergy so that there's some kind of a change. But in anger, it's a twofold passion. It's a complex passion, St. Thomas says. It's a perception of injury. To which St. Thomas said, essentially we're talking about sorrow. The person has a sorrow. Something bad has happened to either them, they, uh, themselves or someone they love. With a desire for vindication. The reason anger is so tiring and exhausting is because the person who holds on to the thing of the anger, holds to the perception of the injury, so he's holding on to the injustice, and then he keeps desiring this vindication, and the vindication is, St. Thomas says, you want to harm the other person or thing to stop it from harming you. And so between this holding on to the injury and the sorrow that comes from it, because when we're sorry for a long period of time, we get kind of wrung out. And the same thing when we're desiring something, we never get it, eventually we get wrung out, and so that's why anger, anger is so tiring. Okay. But getting back to this is the, if the, the saint recognizes that there's no punishment that could be meted out against him in this life that he is not deserving of because of his sin. And so when things happen to him, he does, it doesn't bother him that much because he realizes, well, I can deserve this anyway. But there's also another component to this, and that is when you're willing to suffer, that you never become angry because it terminates in sorrow. When somebody does something bad, you no longer want to harm them. You don't have that desire. You're just, you, it terminates in sorrow, which basically means what? You're willing to suffer this thing in some manner. Okay. You can, this could also happen when a person just doesn't realize you're never going to get vindication from this person. So I just have to put up with this. So they kind of have this despair as a part of it, too. But in this particular case, that willingness to suffer helps the person when injustices occur to them or when things that they love, like the church or their country or what have you, or their family even, when these things happen, it just terminates in sorrow and they're willing to suffer that. This, I think that we're going to, we're in, we're in, one of the reasons why anger is becoming so predominant is because of the fact that the things that people really do love are just being trounced on and they're not, they don't have any detachment from it and they're not willing to suffer. So if you were going to enter into a period of chastisement, if you're not willing to suffer well, which is going to be what? What's a period of chastisement? A period of chastisement is a period in which there's lots of pain in a variety of different ways. And so you have to be willing to suffer that pain in some manner. And if you're not willing to, then you're going to get angry. This is why people get angry with God. He allows them to suffer for their own purification, but in the end, they don't do it well. And so they end up getting angry with God. But it's really their own fault. Our Lady said at Quito, 
quote, in order to free men from, bond, from bondage to these heresies, those whom the merciful love of my most holy son will dis destine for, the de for that restoration will need great strength of will, constancy, valor, which means they have to fight for it, and confidence in God. Probably, uh, as I get older, the, one of the vices that I'm seeing is kind of a despair or a lack of confidence in God. People just don't trust God. There's a lot of fear out there today, too. Should we fear the ch upcoming chastisement? No. Why? If you suffer well, when the evil comes, it doesn't bug you. Actually, you're just like, eh, okay, that means I get to become holier through this process. Whereas when the person, when a person has all these things that they're attached to, that's why their fear rises because they know they're going to lose these things or they could lose their normalcy of life or what have you. I mean, think about it. It depends on how God would allow the flow of it, but he could allow the destruction to be so extreme that in point in fact, um, you know, you're the only person alive in your family. Or the fact is that you would be you, that the government may step in in order to keep control over the situation, sequester people into FEMA camps. I mean, they've talked about it, whether it's true or not, who knows. But the fact of the matter is, is that this could happen. Could you live in a camp, basically, in a concentration camp for the rest of your life, and would it affect your, your equanimity, your peace, your joy? If you read the stories about people who are in concentration camps... There's a few, th usually they, they, they suffer from a th one of three things. Fear, because they're constantly in fear of what's going to happen to them in their life. They might get hurt, etc. Despair, you know, because they're in it for a while and it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to change. Or anger. And it's all because it all boils down to they're not willing to suffer. The person who's willing to suffer well actually has great confidence in God because the suffering is not going to deter him from recognizing God's goodness even in the suffering. So Our Lady says that God is going to, they're going to need great strength to get to that restoration and confidence in God. She says, quote, to test this faith and confidence of the just, there will be occasions in which everything will seem to be lost and paralyzed. Well, we don't know ultimately what that means, but we could extrapolate. It basically means our way of life isn't going to exist anymore. And the way things that we, our normalcy of life is going to be gone. Practically everything will lost. I've come to the conclusion that God has to basically allow the destruction of the infrastructure. Because we're between the internet and all these other things, we have become so evil in the use of these things that the only solution is just to wipe the slate clean and then let human beings recoup from there. She says, uh, let's reread this again. To test this faith and confidence of the just, there will be occasions in which everything will seem to be lost and paralyzed. This will be, then, the happy beginning of the complete restoration. We know that there's still a period of peace to come. It hasn't come here yet, by the way. Second, we know this through Fatima. She says, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. So we know that Our Lady's Immaculate Heart is going to be the thing that will bring about the restoration. This makes sense on two levels. One, the restoration cannot happen without sanctifying grace and actual grace, and she is the source and conduit of that. So she's mediating small grace. Second, she is the conqueress of all heresy. Modernism is the synthesis of all heresies, and in a certain sense, I think that God, this is my own kind of speculation, God allowed this heresy to arise, if for no other reason than to just let Our Lady crush the thing underfoot, right? So that in that process, she would gain that honor and glory because he wants to draw attention to her. But so there will be this complete restoration, which means we're going to go through some horrific situation where practically everything is going to be lost. And then in the end, there will be this restoration, primarily of the church, if nothing else.
she says at another place, I can't remember if it's, if it's keto, she says that when the chastisement comes, after the chastisement, there will be 25 years of good harvest, and as a result of that, people will grow lax again. The speculation of those theologians that I've talked to says that's when the Antichrist is coming. Because that laxening will be worse even than it is now. The Marian apparitions for almost two centuries now have repeatedly called attention to the necessity to fast and do penance. Why? One, in other words, what I basically our lady is saying is you have to suffer. You have to be willing to suffer, right? But the re- the reason for it is is because it's by doing um, penance and fasting that we get our lower faculties subordinated, our emotions subordinated, and those things subordinated to reason and to what faith knows that we have to do in order so that there's right order in us. And so that the society will become more rightly ordered. We have to have some kind of fasting, even if a na- as a natural virtue, because if we don't, then we end up like the problem we have in our culture, which is a common case of obesity, right? What is it? I think it's 25% of the adults in the United States are now obese. Although sometimes I wonder if that isn't connected to some of the um, genetically modified stuff. But that all being said, the point being is, is that we have to be willing to, to purify ourselves and get right order in us interiorly. And that can only come through fasting and penance. And fasting, I also mean abstinence. So people say, Father, I can't fast. Yeah. There's only a small percentage of people that can't really fast. And even then, there's little things they can give up in order to get those lower faculties under control. I get headaches. Yeah, get in line. <laughs> Doesn't mean you don't do it. All right. But the other reason, which is that we have to do prayer and penance and fasting, but penance is to make restitution to God for the profound evil that we have caused. God created this world for his, to manifest his glory, and every time any one of us sins, we detract from that glory to which he has a right. This is why... You must stand in front of him at the end of time when Christ returns and account before because he's the public authority and he created this universe for his glory and you detracted from that. You have to stand before everybody else, all the angels, all the saints, all the damned, and account for every single infraction of the law. You have that obligation. You must make public restitution to the public authority that you have acted against. People say things like, oh, but God forgives and forget. Well, first of all, that's absurd. God can't change, so he can't forget. Second of all, how just would it be to God if he kept letting people off of stuff and nobody had, that no, like, for example, they say the reason for the final judge, public, uh, general judgment is so that people's good name that shouldn't have had it is, is taken away from them legitimately. And then those whose good name was taken, it was detracted against in this life, it's properly restored. So God wouldn't be just if this whole thing, he, he is absolutely and perfectly just. And so all of this has to happen. But it basically boils down to what? Making restitution to God. What do we call that? Reparation. Now restitution means you're paying back to God what you owe him. It's a kind of a, there's two parts to restitution. So restitution actually has two parts. The first is what they call the natural order of justice. So if I steal 50 cents from you, I have to give you 50 cents. I can't give it to John. I have to give it to you. Because there's that natural order that has to be restored. So there's the natural order. And then there's what they call the transcendent order. And that is to God. Because you stole, I've stolen from you, I've also offended God, principally and primarily. And so I have to restore something in relationship to Him. 
So the normal, in the natural order, the normal way this works is the, uh, let me back up. The, way you, the way you fulfill the transcendent order of justice is first and foremost by fulfilling the natural order of justice. The way I make reparation to God for my sin of theft is I give Johnny his, or I give you back the 50 cents I took from you. Which, by the way, if that's all you have in your pocket, um, I might be able to help you out because you're so poor you need help. All right. So the point being is, is that you actually have to uh, fulfill that natural order of justice. But there are times when the natural order of justice cannot be uh, repaired. So, for example, suppose I steal 50 bucks from my Aunt Bessie, who's 100 years old, the next week she dies, and so then I can't give her the money back. That doesn't release you from the obligations of the transcendent order of justice. This is why the church used to say, if it's impossible to fulfill the natural order of justice, then you give the $100 to the poor or to the church or something of that sort. What does any of this have to do with our situation now? The principal way that you make trans, uh, the rest, of, by the way, <coughs> reparation means you're repairing the damage that's been done. And that damage is giving back to, the damage is first getting the natural order reestablished. And that comes in two ways. In relationship to other people, I have to pay back what I owe to them. But in relationship to myself, when I commit a sin that causes my own interior disorder, like let's just say I sit down and wolf down an entire box of chocolates, and as a result of that, I'm sick and I'm bloated. The next day I wake up with a hangover from the ch sugar. Okay, how do I make the restitution? I fast to get my concupiscible appetite, which is the one that desires food, I gotta get it un back under control because each time I do something in a disordered way, it trains that faculty in a disordered way. So the principal way you make reparation to God is getting your faculty straightened out. This is what purgatory is all about. And this is what fasting is all about. This is why in the Old Testament, they would um, put on sackcloth and sit in ashes to humiliate themselves and to go through that uncomfort to get that stuff straightened back out and to humiliate themselves to show their proper place in relationship to God. The second thing is then you got to make they got to make that fulfill the transcendent order. So in reparation, the principle way you do it is by restoring the natural order. But then again, that may restoring the natural order doesn't necessarily always fulfill the transcendent order. There are certain kinds of sins for which the natural order is incapable of being restored. You cannot restore a woman after she's been raised to her original state. You cannot repair or restore the, uh, an aborted child. They're dead. You can't bring it back to life. Okay. So that means that there's a transcendent order that has to be fulfilled here in relationship to God. Now, normally, if we get our natural order back together, we're also fulfilling a certain, a certain part of that order to God because this is where his glory is, is in the natural order. And so he'll usually back off and not punish us. This is what we see in the Old Testament. So, but if we don't, then what happens is, is not only does God put an end to it because we're offending him so much, but he puts an end to it for our sake as an act of mercy. You know how when some, kid, some kids will get, they get so tore up and so worked up and they're falling so hard that they get to the point where they can't even breathe? All right. At that point, the parent steps in and spanks them and says, knock it off. Right? Why? For the kid's sake. You want them to breathe. Right? Okay. So the point being is that it's the same thing with God is the reason for a chastisement is both justice and mercy. One, to restore this natural order of justice and make restitution to each other and to ourselves and get ourselves straightened out. But the second thing is an act of mercy because we have become an abomination unto ourselves. The definition of abomination is something which by its nature is worthy of detestation and loathing. We have become so disordered, and our modern, modern man has become so disordered that we're an abomination. 
even to ourselves. So this is something, and you see this because you know people can't even stand themselves anymore. Right? So this is something that this is one of the reasons why Our Lady wants us to make restitution. Now, part of the difficulty is one time when I was in the seminary, I was teaching this class on tradition. It was the, it's the first year of theology. And what I did was, I said, well, if you're a traditionalist, then uh, if you believe this, you're not a traditionalist. So what I did is for 45 minutes, I just kept saying, if you believe this, you're not a traditionalist because here it is in the literature. If you believe this, you're not a traditionalist because here it is in the literature. And I went on for 45 minutes. Now, there was a reason I was doing that because seminarians, when they enter into theology, their head swells a little bit. And you have to deflate it so that they can think clearly. Okay. And one of the seminarians came up to me afterwards and says, well, I got the point, but did you have to go on for 45 minutes? I said, it's only because I went on for 45 minutes that you got the point. <laughs> if, I would have, if I would have just done it for a couple of minutes, their head still would have been, I mean, some balloons take a while for the air to get out of, right? Okay. It's the same problem we have now. The intensity of, the, of any upcoming chastisement is going to be horrific. Why? Because human beings have gotten to the point where they're almost, or they are, beyond correction from the outside. It has to get to the point where it is so bad that people, even the most evil, will stop and take a look at it and say, this is bad news. If there's just a little bit of kerfluffle, if we just end up in a depression, or if we have another, you know, a recession, or if, or if something happens here or there, or if only one country gets taken out, the world is going to continue on as normal. It's not until God's going to bring us to our knees, and it's got to be brutally painful. When I was in school, there was no such thing as ADH, ADD. There's no such thing. It's because there's too much pain in the rear end for them to lose focus. Okay, what does that mean? It basically means that one of the ways, my dad used to say, you know, one of the ways you get a person's attention is by a stick, right? And I think that's one of the things that's, that's coming is God's going to have to get us our attention in order for us to get our act together. This means on our part, if we don't master that willingness to suffer when they when it becomes horrific, and even for the perfect, it's going to be difficult, uh, people are going to come out the other end pretty brutalized. If you want peace through that and joy, even through the chastisement, you have to master that willingness to suffer. And this means there has to be a serious growth in virtue. One, in just the natural virtues. You know, you just actually have to master the natural virtue of fasting and abstinence and and working on, um, you know, basic justice and fortitude, getting rid of your fears, working on, you know, prudence and things of this sort, just being prudent. Next, you need to work on all those infused virtues, both theological and moral. So you need to actually do what? You need to master fasting for God's sake, not for yours, for God's. And you need to master fortitude and prudence and all those things for God's sake. That willingness to suffer, which is part of the sub-virtue to fortitude, you have to master that in relationship to God. You know, we actually, people have a natural, there's a natural virtue of mortification, by the way. And we see it all the time. People who are in sports regularly will deny themselves all sorts of stuff for the sake of achieving a certain excellence in their sports. With us, it has to be for God's sake. We also have to work on the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Faith in recognizing that it doesn't matter. See, the beauty of, of Vatican I is when they define that a pope uh, we know that he that when he speaks under these conditions, he's infallible. What the church was also saying is, outside these conditions, he's not infallible. 
Then what's ironic is, is in Vatican II, they said, well, outside that context, what is our supposed to be our stance in relationship to these teachings that he has? And they use the word, they use the phrase religiosum obsequium, which means religious obedience. So normally, obedience, as the authors say, and this and discussion of this means, is that normally speaking, you believe what he says, unless it's clearly contrary to what the church teaches. So if, the, if a pope gets up there and be, uh, ends up a heretic, which, by the way, there's been a few that have already, Pope Honorius ended up having to get judged by Innocent III as a heretic later. But the point being is, is if it happens, it shouldn't affect our faith in the slightest. When the bishops aren't doing their job or when there's scandals in churches, it shouldn't affect our faith in the slightest. None of this, anything, nothing that is happening should affect our faith in the slightest. You know, when you see these priests or bishops run off and say stuff or do stuff that is completely scandalous, it shouldn't affect you in the, at all. I mean, the only thing you should be worried about is praying for the salvation of his soul. Or it should never affect any of our charity. What's sad is, is Christ said, because the apostles asked, what's it going to be like in the end? And he says, men will become lovers of pleasure and charity will grow cold. People who love pleasure are never charitable. And the reason being is, is because pleasure is principally in the body, although it's also in the intellect and will, but it's principally in the body, and so as a result of that, they're really only interested in things that are carnal and not in things that are spiritual, and so they have no charity. I always tell people, if, everybody, if, if you have somebody that you're living around who's constantly telling you to be nice, look for the knife in your back. It's coming. Because it's always based on emotion, right? But the point being, and so that means as soon as their emotion changes, you've got to watch for the knives, okay? Kevlar is my recommendation, okay? <laughs> the point being is, is you have to have perfect charity. It doesn't matter how badly a priest or a bishop treats you. It doesn't matter what the, what, what the Pope or some other person may end up saying that you might find disagreeable. It doesn't matter what your people in your family, it should never affect your charity, which is love of God. Because that's really what charity is. It's being able to love God and love your neighbor for God's sake, which is still God. So it really boils down to you can't allow anyone else come to be, come between you and God. Hope, obviously, we have to have hope. Hope, the definition of hope is the awaiting of the divine assistance in achieving our salvation. We just, with hope, we just await, we know God is going to provide what is necessary for my salvation. This is true even in the period of a chastisement, or even now, up to the chastisement, when things are so bad. It shouldn't, it shouldn't cause us to lose hope. When we read the apparitions of Our Lady, she talks about the fact that these things are going to be the precursor, these things are going to happen. Christ himself started talking about all the things that were going to happen before the coming of the Antichrist. And so when those things start to happen, what it should really do is bolster our hope. Because we should look at that and say, what he says there is true. It's happening. And that means he saw it and he knew it and he's God. And therefore what he said in these other matters that we can trust him and that he'll be there with us always is also true. So it should actually firm up our hope in God. It's, it's, uh, and also Our Lady said, you know, yeah, there's going to be this chastisement, there's going to be this era of peace too, which is going to be unprecedented historically. The kind of peace, from the impression I read from the authors and the way Our Lady talks about it, the kind of peace we're going to have after the chastisement is going to be extraordinary. It's going to be a delightful, I mean, it'll take a little bit to recover, but it'll be a delightful time to be living but therein lies the danger with people if they're not careful. So our hope, all these apparitions, when we read all the bad stuff, we see it unfolding, like our, when our lady said at Akita, you know, cardinal will be against cardinal and bishop against bishop. Well, there it is. We see it. We've seen it in the last year. So, okay. So that just tells us everything else she told us is true, and we can trust her. You have to have a habitual life of prayer especially the rosary and the meditation. 
For almost two centuries now, Our Lady has been constantly repeating the refrain, pray the rosary daily. And there are several reasons for it. One is it's the spiritual weapon against anything that's diabolic. Two, it provides, there's, there's a grace that God gives to the person who prays daily, the rosary daily to maintain their Catholicity, their orthodoxy, and their clear head. Two, three. It is also the fulfillment of justice. The authors tell us that you cannot fulfill the, ju the requirements of justice to God in relationship to the virtue of religion without praying every single day. And they say, what's the minimum for a layman? 15 minutes, <laughs> which is roughly the time for a rosary. That doesn't fulfill the requirements of charity, of course. Charity means that if you really loved God, you'd be trying to pray all the time because you'd want to be with him. But the rosary is one of those key things. And also the rosary, you know, one of the things that we've seen is, is the, there's been, I don't know if you've, any of you have been watching, but once in a while there'll be these rosary crusades where they try and get a million rosaries said for an intention. <laughs> and it, it's bringing about its effect. So this is something that should be a thing of hope. It's a powerful thing today. But it also, uh, Arakita, Our Lady said, the only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests. Yeah, obviously, we need the prayers. And if you look at all the disorder that's occurring within the church, you... You know, it's really counterproductive to sit there and curse the priests and bishops when they're already cursed. You might as well pray for them so that something changes. But, you, but in addition to the rosary, you really need to do meditation. And there's two reasons, or three, sorry, three reasons why. The first is, is meditation is using the imagination. Now, our emotions are moved by what's in the imagination. And this is why St. Thomas says you cannot overcome imperfections in your emotional life or any other kind of perfection without habitual meditation. It's impossible. The second thing is, is that meditation, um, which some of you have heard me talk about, is one of the principal means to avoid diabolic obsession. If the demons are extraordinarily strong and they seem to be running amok at the moment, you don't even need to see them physically to see their little footy prints all over the place. The fact of the matter is, is that the daily meditation is going to help you to keep your sanity through all of this. The third is that Teresa of Avila said that there's nine levels of prayer. And it's impossible, so the first one is vocal prayer, next one's meditation, it's impossible to ascend to the heights of prayer, the other seven, or other six levels, seven levels, sorry, other seven levels without entering th to those through meditation. In other words, people who think that they're going to become saints without meditation are deluded. It's impossible. You're not going to eradicate, most people will plateau in their spiritual life, and it's because they're not meditating or they're not meditating well. And this is one of the key things. But the meditation will be one of the principal things because the intellect is be, or the imagination is being filled with the things of God which cause the emotions to calm down, which means when things start to happen, we won't emotionally react as much and we'll have a lot more peace and equanimity when all this hits. Most people are doing nothing to keep themselves spiritually protected. And by that I mean, they're not saying any prayers to keep the demons at bay at all in their life. So I highly recommend that. Another thing is, if the chastisement's coming and we all, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, a third of us get wiped out in this room, the fact of the matter is, is that means that a third of us are going to die. Or more, depending on where we're located. And so one of the things that has always been considered a bad sign that is, a sign of lacking of God's favor is a death which is sudden and unprovided. <laughs> and so one of the things that you want to do is the nine first Fridays so that you don't die an unprovided death. When I was a kid, my mom drug us to the nine first Fridays. I think I made them like three or four times, maybe five times in a series with uh, in our family. My brother 
uh, when he was 19, did it again on his own just as an act of devotion. When he was in his car accident at 20 and died, there were five priests at his deathbed. That, I saw that being fulfilled. My other brother who died, it says, you will not die an unprovided death. My other brother was uh, died about a year and a half ago, and he got all the sacraments, even the apostolic blessing, before he died. The point being is, is that the nine first Fridays are also there to make ref reparation to the sacred heart, and that's one of the things that people simply aren't doing. People simply are not making enough reparation. This is one of the reasons why God's going to pull the plug. I actually had a case of possession once, and the demon's name was Loki. You know, some of you heard me talk about this guy, and his shtick was he was assigned by Satan to distract men from vocations by getting them to become worldly. He's been phenomenally successful. And Anytime you would mention reparation to the sacred heart, this guy would just go into meltdown mode. But what does this tell you? It tells you that one of the reasons we don't have any vocations is because A, we're not keeping the demons at bay and protective vocations, but B, we're not making reparation for negligence in the area of vocations. This is one of the reasons why. Reparation is key. Our Lady said at Fatima about the first Saturday devotion, I promise to help at the hour of death with graces necessary for salvation those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, say five decades of the rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the mysteries with the intention of making reparation to my Immaculate Heart. One demon one time said to me that Our Lady <coughs> and Our Lord are so absolutely united that to make reparation to one is de facto to make reparation to the other. Sacramental life. Obviously, we have to be getting into confession at least once a month or more. There should be regular mass attendance. And by the way, this regular mass attendance, you know, people say, oh, well, I just can't make it to daily mass. Really? What time is it at? It's at 8. Do you work? No. Why can't you make it? I just have a hard time getting out of bed then. It takes me about 45 minutes to get going. I bet if I stood next to your bed with a baseball bat, you'd get there pretty quick. <laughs> Not that I'm suggesting violence is the solution to everything, but I'm just saying that. People's motivation, we are so pathetically weak. Just the littlest thing, oh, I just can't do it. Right? Yeah. When I, when I was growing up, we would have done that. Wow. The point being is, is that getting to daily Mass is also extremely helpful because as we go through this period of time, we're going to need a lot of sacramental graces to survive this thing mentally and psychologically and spiritually. And this brings up the last point. Before I end with a more positive note. You have to be prepared for the fact that you may be entering a period where you will not get regular access to the sacraments. And I think part of that is God's punishment for the fact that the sacrament, especially Holy Communion, has been so readily available. And so many people have been traipsing up there and having sacrilegious communions. I think that's part of the reason. And this is not my own speculation. There have been bits and pieces of various prophecies talking about the fact that the mass will be practically eclipsed, and it won't even hardly be said. And various, you know, and so in other words, there's going to be there may be a period where you're not going to get access to a priest in confession. This is why I tell people, you know, when it comes to mortal sin, I don't care the level of suffering and pain you go through. You have to stop it now, because if you don't, what happens if you die sudden, suddenly, or die suddenly? But also, what's going to happen? What's going to happen if we go into a period where you're not going to get access to the sacraments? Quite frankly, this is my own speculation, 
you're free to chastise me if you like. But if Hillary Clinton would have got in there, I could have easily seen something like that coming down the pike. The point being is, is that if we abuse something, God will often take it from us. And this is, what's, this is I think, what's happening in relationship to the sacraments of the church. So you have to get yourself spiritually prepared to where your interior life is so solid that if you go a year or two without getting to confession, you're not going to end up in hell over it. Or if you don't get, if you don't aren't able to get to mass for whatever reason because of the fact that the chastisement hits and there's martial law or something like that, it's not going to kill you. So, not that we shouldn't try and make. My basic point is what: make use of the sacraments now to gain that holiness, but be prepared in your spiritual life through meditation, mortification, all those virtues necessary, overcoming all your defects. In other words, you have to start working on becoming a saint so that when this hits. You're, you're not ill-prepared. That's my biggest concern, is that we're not, we're very ill-prepared. Even the best of us in this, probably in this room, even the best of us are not prepared to be able to deal with what's coming down the pike. So what's the positive note? God's chastisement is for the be- our betterment. It's ultimately an act of mercy and it's an act of love. Quite frankly, to any good Catholic, living today is chronic pain. It's chronically painful. You're constantly dealing with the disorders in society and the sinfulness. You're constantly dealing with the sinfulness within the church. The sad part of it is, is that most people are not sorry because of how much offense God has taken. Let me give you an example of how much, how patient and merciful God is. Let's just say for the sake of argument, Worldwide, each person only committed one venial sin a day. It still means that God would be offended almost 7 billion times a day. We're just talking about one venial sin per person. And yet, look how merciful he is. Look how much he's... he's, So the chastisement that's coming down the pike, is it justice? Yes. Because he's going to restore the right order and we have a price to pay. On the other hand, it's an act of mercy. And what's going to come out the other end is actually going to be very joyful. For those who love Our Lady, seeing her be the cause or the instrument for the restoration will be a source of tremendous joy and satisfaction. There will be mass conversions worldwide. This is going to be, there's going to be a complete change in all of this. It's going to be horrific for a while, but when we come out the other end, the church will be restored to its former glory and even more. You know, now it's in, its, it's in a decline. The, there will be right order, at least initially, not entirely, but at least initially in civil governments and things of this sort. We might even see a vast majority of the countries actually profess Christ as, as um, king of the country. And, each, and the countries will become confessionally Catholic. We're going to see these drastic changes actually end up occurring. So, those of you who are young, my only recommendation is, is this. Be very wary when things are easy. Do not slacken off on your own mortification when things are easy. Because it's going to come a time, and this is the thing that keeps sticking in my mind in reading these prophecies. It's good for 20 to 25 years, and then after that, it's going to be worse than it is now. So to avert that from happening, which is not going to happen anyway, so I don't know why I'm warning people, but to, to my recommendation, obviously, is, is listen to what Our Lady is saying. 25 years, people will start to la- slack and don't slack. And, okay. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus sanctions super vos et semper. Amen. Amen.